on the way down from the highest pass road in Scotland, UK, which is Glen Shee, and it borders Aberdeenshire and Perth and Kinross. And it's just a nice, a nice road from Glen Shee. Chair all the way back to Braemar, it's just a nice drive. I've seen an osprey here earlier, I've seen a red kite, I've seen an, a golden eagle earlier, I've seen a trail today, which isn't bad. A uh, lot, lot of nice bits of walking here, some good, good parking. A lot of bikers behind me, I'm just going to kind of let them zoom on by. Once around this bend, I'll just let them nip past. years back, uh, I've pitched all the way down this glen, that water to my left is good quality drinking water, it runs right off the Cairnwell, which is a Monroe, uh, just the chairlift, it's the most accessible Monroe in Scotland, because it's the parking's at the bottom of it and it's a pretty easy day. Once you're at the top, there's a sign straight back to the bottom, it's almost diff well, it's very difficult to get lost on it, but, however, it's still a Monroe, it's still extremely cold up there in the winter. I've been up there, it's been minus 20. Uh, easy to get caught out, even though you're only a walk, it's still a couple of, you know, it's still a, a fair old trek back down. So, aye, this is a lovely spot, it really is. The, the drive down into Braemar and kind of Royal D side, Balmoral, Balater. It's, lo it's a lovely kind of drive, it really is. But you've got to take your time and enjoy it. There's no point in the. Uh, there's no point in hurtling through here at 80 mile an hour and not seeing anything. I mean, it always astonishes me that people will go and drive halfway around Scotland and do it in a day, or do the do the North Coast 500 in a day or two days, and they, they can't be seeing anything. There's no way because it takes a while to take everything in, and there's so much more than the obvious you know, landmarked, well-known footfall sightseeing spots that you get. There's way more than that to see. I actually avoid the mainstream places because I know the good places, the, the alternative places. Yeah, I'll still nip into smoke caves and stuff at, at their nests and I'll still, you know, but I'll avoid them when it's peak because it's just silly season. But anyway, this is a this is a nice drive, and you kind of you know you always get that feeling with this drive that a big twelve pointer stag uh, is just going to waltz right out in front of you, and that does happen often, uh, especially in the 
the colder weather when they're off the hill and they're all along this road. I've seen hundreds of stags and, and hinds lying all down here. And they, they, they sometimes don't move for you, they just... Well, why should they? It's, it's, it's their country, you know, it's their neck of the woods, so... I see quite a bit of planting going on. Alder and Rowan and stuff like that. Anything that grows well near the water. I've kind of got mixed feelings about the planting and the rewilding. I don't like who's behind it. I don't like the propaganda behind it. too much. What you tend to find as well is uh, a lot of the a lot of the river banks are really really bad on the D with erosion and I don't see any attempts what at all to kind of like minimalize the damage or you know minimise the, the the erosion with gabion baskets or stone or or like proper replanting uh, the bankings are falling away really badly I've, I've been down the river all the way down it and it's it's a shame to see the, the, the condition of it in places Especially when you consider the amount of money that the salmon fishing will generate and the grants and stuff that the estate owners get and the landowners have access to. A bit of moderate maintenance wouldn't go amiss, but it's like everything in Scotland. Uh, it's all singular agenda. It's like one person owns this half and the other person owns that half and it's whatever they say goes. And what may add, what may actually be logical and beneficial doesn't even get a, a mention or become a concern. It's like they do whatever they want, basically. That's the problem with land ownership and land management and upland moor management, which goes on here. But it's also a problem with whoever owns the the key to the castle. Because if they're part of the woke brigade, then it's all about it's all about that rewilding strategy. Uh, there's a sign there, River Clooney uh, rewilding strategy, replanting. You know, it's all about access and funds, and it's all about whatever suits the the most funded. Most funded agenda. A lot of it's ludicrous, a lot of it has got no benefit other than to an extremely small minority of the population, and it all leads to further access to the next allotment of funds. It's, it's widely corrupt and it's massively underreported. So, yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of single entities owning hundreds of thousands of hectares of Scottish land, foreign entities, uh, you know, billionaires offsetting tax and capital against Scottish land that was probably originally stolen anyway. So procured by theft over the centuries, regardless of what anybody thinks that's factual. There's somebody tented up on the river there, nice little spot. So all land in Scotland was stolen back in the day. You've got the Highland clearances and in the 1700s you've got the Lowland clearances, which are often ignored, which were every bit as, as barbaric as the Highland. Clearances. 
people just really think about things like the Glencoe massacre, but there was so much more went on down in the lowlands as well. And all of the dukes and all of the, the current day landowners are all responsible for all of that theft. And if you forensically trace land ownership, you'll soon find who stole it all and from who tenant farmers stole it and then rented it back to them and taxed the life out of them. Horrific. Scotland's got a horrific history with land ownership and land theft. That's why I see a challenge to any access and, you know, rights to catch fish and fish rivers. I, I see I see a legal challenge on, on all of it. I do. I really do. You know, you're talking about owning water that, that flows across land into the sea and fish that come from the sea and migrate and then go back to sea and, and you know, someone lays claim to their ownership. What you're actually paying for is the right to access the land and access the water. You're, you know, the actual legality of access and fishing rights and all the rest of it is very, very questionable on moving water under the Migratory Fish Act. All questionable. Very much so. In my opinion. And I just think that it's coming to, it's getting to that point now where you know all the old Hurrah Brigade and you know the Tweed Suit Brigade are kinda like a thing of the past now and yeah if you still want to do that then by all means crack on but you know don't be looking down on other people as third and fourth class citizens and thinking that you're above your station because we're all Jock Tamsin's Burns you know we're all we're all just people breathing the same air so I'm not a fan of classes and you know all of that nonsense. But I can see that all of this hillside to my right has been rewilded with uh, native deciduous, which is like leaf shedding uh, trees, non, -conif non coniferous, non invasive species. Yeah, it will add a bit of colour and a bit of life, it'll be great for bird life and it might bring certain species back. There also, there's also the, the talk about re, reintroducing lynx to Scotland which have been gone for, you know, six, seven hundred years probably. There are a few lynx in Scotland that are escapees from private collections, all that have been let go by people who have their own agenda. Uh, yeah, I think Lynx would do pretty well in certain areas, Lochaber, uh, maybe round about the Cairngorms, certainly round about here, but the Scottish Wildcat's in massive decline because the gene pool's so polluted. Uh, I just don't think that landowners in particular, keeper to states, will allow lynx to flourish unchallenged. People talk about letting wolves go before, you know what they'll be letting bears go. Maybe if you had massive enclosures, which takes away the naturalisation, but I mean I would love I would love to be out in the mountains and hear wolves in Scotland. I think that would be incredible to actually hear wolves howling during mating. Market territory, I think that would be phenomenal to be out at night and hear that. And I would have no problem walking on land with, with wolves running wild. Uh, you'd be probably lucky to see them, they're quite elusive. But folk make a song and dance about it. And you know, if you don't want to get into the countryside because the wolves don't go. Lynx, fairly, fairly small, you know. Well, maybe an average sized cat, they're a couple of feet, you know, at the shoulder. Very good climbers, very agile. 
they would hunt hares, rabbit, possibly young roe deer, but more so like ground nesting birds, eh, voles, small mammals, beached fish, spent salmon, you know, they, 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 they have a place. They most definitely have a place. Be great to see, it really would. Well, weather, who knows? Anyway, I'm back in Braemar. So I need to slow down for the red squirrels. There's loads of them here. And I'm going to get a cup of tea. And then I'm heading to the other side of the gorms. So there you go. There's a wee bit of chin wag.